Pour yourself a cup of tea, put your feet up, and relax. Show host Randy Fine, narcissistic abuse expert, compassionate counselor for clients worldwide, and author of the groundbreaking new book, Close Encounters of the Worst Kind, invites you into her sanctuary, a place where your emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being are all that matters. To Heal is a fundraising single written and performed by Johnny Z for the Amy Winehouse Foundation. For more information, please go to johnnymusic.com, J-O-N-N-Y music.com. And now, it's time to meet Randy, show host of the podcast enjoyed by fans around the globe, A Fine Time for Healing. Good morning. Thank you for tuning in to listen to... There it is. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for tuning in to listen to A Fine Time for Healing. This is Randy Fine. Uh, today is Free Advice Friday, the day that you guys call in and ask me your questions about narcissistic abuse. And, you know, I just realized that I've been doing this show since August 14th of 2015. So that's... Um, a year, about a year and a month that I've been doing this show. And in the time that I've done it, I've only, I think I've only received two calls uh, for asking for advice, which is kind of disappointing to me because um, the reason I'm doing this show is because I really want you to call in and talk to me and, you know, and ask me your questions so other people can hear and I can help you uh, so that you don't have to necessarily go through counseling with me, but you could get some help. So, um, I may have to reconsider doing this show if I don't start getting some calls. But um, but anyway, if you'd like to call in, and I hope that you do, the number to call is 424-220-1801. Um, and you can call in. I will answer your call. <laughs> uh, so today, um, while I'm waiting to see if anybody does call in, I'm going to talk about narcissistic victim syndrome. And this is where it gets confusing for psychi psychiatrists and psychologists. This is the syndrome that they don't know how to recognize. And so therefore, um, patients or clients are often misdiagnosed. Most of us are aware of the symptoms we're, we are experiencing and how they impact our lives long before we look for professional help for them. But fitting our symptoms together in a way that makes sense is very difficult. This is why we feel so confused by the way we feel. So it's important to know about narcissistic victim syndrome. Once we can identify what's wrong with us, we can then begin to heal with the appropriate process. Um, the process that I use to help people heal from this abuse is I don't know um, I don't know what to call it. Uh, it's insight oriented um, counseling, but it works really quickly. Um, I know I've probably said this before, but it amazes me every single time. So. If you're really hurting, I urge you to seek some help um, 
and hopefully with me because I can get to the bottom of it. But maybe you'll understand a little more as I explain what narcissistic victim syndrome is and why it's so hard for um, psychologists and psychiatrists to understand. So let's first talk about all the symptoms that can be involved in narcissistic victim syndrome. Um, Depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, self-loathing, hopelessness, self-harming, restlessness, fatigue, avoidance behaviors, phobias, worry, unexplained pain or physical symptoms, which, which are called somatizations, weight or eating issues, signs of physical abuse. And post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, such as hypervigilance, hyperarousal, irritability, flashbacks, poor concentration, insomnia, nightmares, emotional numbing, memory loss, and heightened startle responses may also be experienced. So um, post-traumatic stress disorder is absolutely a symptom of narcissistic abuse. Um, More commonly, it is complex uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and I'll talk about that in a little while. So some of the ways that narcissistic abuse sufferers describe themselves are empty, lonely, torn, confused, suicidal, unable to cope, ridden with guilt, angry, sometimes uncontrollably angry, lost, unmotivated or uninterested, attached. The methods used to adapt to the abuse that you've suffered also factor into a narcissistic victim um, syndrome diagnosis. Everyone copes differently with the psychological stress and the internal conflict that's caused by narcissistic abuse. Some coping strategies aid in the acceptance of the problem. Some aid in the denial of it. And those that aid in denial are known as involuntary coping mechanisms. Some of the mechanisms, well, I'll I'll actually name all the mechanisms that um, fall under the involuntary coping mechanisms of this disorder. And then I'll explain to you what they are. One is dissociation. The other is infantile regression. Stockholm syndrome, which is also known as trauma bonding. Cognitive dissonance. Magical thinking. Post-traumatic stress disorder and complex complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So let me first explain dissociation to you. You may have heard it, but let me, let me explain it. Dissociation is a protective device that the mind uses when someone is severely traumatized or even acutely stressed. It allows the person to temporarily disconnect from his or her emotional, physical, or environmental reality. This is an automatic stopgap that prevents the development of a full-blown psychotic episode. So this is something that your subconscious mind does so that you don't go insane from all the pressure that you're under. When in crisis, dissociation can be a beneficial mechanism because it absorbs emotional shock and it protects our psychological health. Health. It helps our mind deal with tough situations or trauma that might otherwise impede our ability to function. Dissociation only becomes a problem when we rely on it to escape, ease, or tranquilize emotional pain. So if you've become reliant on this long term, it can be very injur- injurious, um, potentially resulting in impaired psychological functioning. But the biggest consequence is that it prevents the healing of your past abuse. And recovering from the trauma of narcissistic victimization is difficult 
for anyone who habitually disconnects from their emotions. And uh, many of you listening uh, probably do this. Um, I've talked to, I've counseled many people who tell me that they disconnect from their emotions. And that's very frustrating for them and for other people. And they don't really know how to reconnect with those emotions. And it's because victims of narcissistic abuse, they rely on this because they don't know any other way to deal with their pain. As products of abusive upbringings, victims never learn healthy coping skills. Children in these environments survive, survive the best way they know how. And then the unhealthy patterns persist into adulthood. If you are dissociating, um, as most adults do who have this problem, you rely on it as a coping skill. And you're usually unaware of what you're doing. Sometimes you are, sometimes you aren't. But through counseling, you can learn to recognize why and when you escape and then gradually learn to tolerate your feelings and develop positive coping mechanisms to replace the negative ones. So that's dissociation. <clears throat> the second one I want to talk about is infantile regression. Now what this is about is when an infant is abused by a parent or their primary prayer, uh, caregiver, their very existence feels threatened. And they have to find a way to survive while remaining dependent on the source of their maltreatment. With no one else to rely on for safety, they find comfort from whoever gives it in whatever way it's given. And if you've been abused, um, it's not given in a very healthy way. And because of this survival skill, caretakers who terrorize them are not perceived as monsters, but as saviors. I know that sounds crazy, but this is what, in, you know, this is what um, this is about. Infants who are treated this way do not fault their saviors. They blame themselves. The worse they're treated, the more they want to appease their abusers and the tighter they cling to them. And this mechanism becomes stored in the unconscious mind. So when faced with similar traumatic experiences in adulthood, that safety mechanism may get triggered. When that happens the person unconsciously reverts back to infantile survival defenses that in a way that's going to soothe his or her anxiety. And this is the response that's known as infantile regression. Infantile regression takes fearful, helpless feeling adults back to the familiar comfort they felt as infants with their abuse caregivers. It, goes, it calls on the same strategies that were used for survival. They use transference. And as adults, surrender to their abusers. They placate them, cling to them, and idolize them just as they did their infant caretakers. This unconscious coping mechanism used the unconscious um, coping mechanism that's used in infantile regression is similar to the traumatic emotional bonding that occurs with Stockholm Syndrome. Um, we've all heard of Stockholm Syndrome, and usually we hear it uh, in regard to hostage situations. Um, this is also known as trauma bonding. It's a survival technique that's used by victims during threatening hostage-type situations it causes them to emotionally bond with their captors. So this, um, as I explain this, this may help you understand why you feel so bonded with someone who you know has treated you so horribly. So those who have been exploited for years and years under the mind control, intimidation, and threats of narcissistic abuse have endured an emotional hostage, hostage system um, Situation, you actually have endured a hostage situation of an emotional level. For that reason, Stockholm Syndrome can just as easily develop in narcissistic abuse victims 
as it can in prisoners of war or abductees of um, hostage takers. Narcissistic abuse victims live in an unpredictable environment with no perceived way to escape. Because of the imbalance of power between their persecutor and them, the abused is entirely at the mercy of his or her abusers. Now, there are two primary conditioning tactics that are used to enforce the narcissist's control. One is gaslighting, which you've heard of. The other is known as reward and abuse, or intermittent good-bad treatment. Both tactics erode a victim's ability to think or act independently. This is the psychological conditioning that springboards Stockholm Syndrome. With reward and abuse, the narcissist will alternate between intimidation, cruelty and hate, and then kindness, apology, and love. This is what trips you up so much. This is why you say, but they say they love me or they can be kind. Through this vacillation of extremes, the narcissist has the ability to control the victim's moods, self-esteem, and feelings of security. And reward and abuse creates a psychological powerlessness and dependence that convinces the victim that he or she cannot escape or survive on their own. In romantic relationships, victims describe this dependency on their abusers as being in love. Um, And this is something that I often have to explain, you know, what love really is. And if you've never experienced what love really is, then something like this can absolutely look like love to you. Um, And this good guy, bad guy game confuses the victim. Having witnessed glimmers of goodness in your persecutor, you hold on to the hope that, that, that your persecutor will change. And... If you find yourself, you're convinced that if you treat your persecutor perfectly, everything will be all right. So that's when you start walking on eggshells. You try your best to placate, please, and demonstrate your love to this person. So whenever he treats you poorly, you believe you've done something to deserve it. If only you hadn't said or done this. He would not have reacted the way he did. And I know those of you out there listening have experienced this and said this to yourself. So this helps to explain it. This is a typical mindset for victims of narcissistic abuse. They know they are being being treated horribly, but they believe they somehow deserve it. And though they desperately want the abuse to stop, they can't see their way out of it. It's hard for victims of this abuse to deny that they are in an enmeshed abusive relationship, yet they feel a strange compulsion to remain in it. Those thoughts are both conflicting and perplexing. Victims know the way they feel does not make sense, though they cannot seem to frame their mind any other way. That is the outcome of Stockholm Syndrome. Victims are virtually unaware of what has happened to them. They don't know that they have been victims of narcissistic abuse, and it is impossible for them to conceptualize the negative way in which they have coped with it. That blindness keeps them stuck in a hostage mindset. And Stockholm Syndrome is very difficult to overcome without the help of a professional. The healing process begins with the willingness and the readiness to accept what happened to you. The second step is recognizing where the hostage mentality came from. And the third step is replacing negative coping skills with positive ones. So this is not an easy thing to do after years of this conditioning. And it takes time for the mind to decondition and then recondition Um, That's why it is so important to get the help of a professional and overcome this, and it can be overcome. To better understand the thought process that goes on in the mind of a victim with Stockholm Syndrome, 
it's important to first understand the unconscious coping me mechanism, which is known as cognitive dissonance. Uh, again, this is a show where I take your calls and answer your questions. So if you'd like to call in and ask me anything, uh, if something I said sparks something in you, please call in at 424-220-1801. Okay, so now let's talk about cognitive dissonance. And that phrase literally means thought disagreement. The term is used to describe the mental stress that comes from having conflicting thoughts, attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors. Cognitive dissonance, as it applies to narcissistic abuse victims, is a psychological defense mechanism used to survive trauma and abuse. In order to restore emotional equilibrium in the absence of positive coping skills, the unconscious mind allows the victims to rationalize away and change feelings of unease and distress that's produced by these opposing thoughts. Um, so, for instance, you know that you should take the children and leave, but you fear what will happen to you if you do. Well, these are conflicting thoughts. Uh, another one is, you love your partner, but nothing about your partner is likable. Um, you believe that your partner or spouse loves you too, but nothing that person does demonstrates that. Uh, this is very confusing. These thoughts disagree. Um, and this is where cognitive dissonance comes in. Um, you want to seek help. But telling the truth means betraying your abuser. You find yourself walking on eggshells all the time around the person. But you're always blamed for making that person angry. These, this doesn't make sense to a logical mind. So this is what your mind has to do. So cognitive dissonance motivates victims through their unconscious minds to justify things or doing things that they would consider wrong or improper under other circumstances, make something seem more important or less important than it really is, create new reasons for doing something that would otherwise go against um, your better judgment, deny, ignore, or avoid information that clashes with what you've already accepted and are comfortable with. So it's no wonder that the decisions made by abuse victims appear illogical to everyone else and, and even to the victims themselves. Unless a person has had a relatable experience, they can't possibly understand the mindset of someone in survival mode. Those in survival mode do not understand their mindsets either. So people on the outside, and, you know, if you've been in, these rela in relationships where people say, get over it, why? They, people tend to be unsympathetic and accusatory and blameful towards narcissistic abuse victims rather than compassionate and understanding. And this judgmental attitude makes victims feel even more worthless, hopeless, helpless, and isolated. So victims needing support and validation cannot find it in their family or friends and sometimes not even with their mental health professionals. Once again, this is why, um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, this is why um, they can see a therapist for years and years and not get any help. Um, so if you are wondering whether you're coping with your abuse issues through cognitive dissonance, you can ask yourself the following question. Do you often rationalize or justify thoughts, actions, or behaviors that make you uncomfortable, whether they are yours or others? I'll say that again. Do you often rationalize or justify thoughts, actions, or behaviors that make you uncomfortable whether these thoughts, actions, and behaviors are yours or not, or someone else's. If you answer yes, it's time to take a closer look. 
becoming aware of when you use this unconscious mechanism will help you understand why you use it and why you have come to rely on it. Once you identify the behavior, it can then be modified. So with the support and validation um, <clears throat> that is needed to calm your trauma-based anxiety, a counselor can help you accept the reality of your experiences and teach you how to express your feelings in emotionally healthier ways. So now I'm going to talk about something that's called, some people call it magical thinking and some people call it Pollyanna, Pollyannaism. 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 Um, when the book The Secret was published in 2006, the positive thinking movement exploded. And the basic theory behind The Secret is that positive thinking manifests in abundance. So truly, I believe that optimism is crucial for our emotional well-being, and I use it in my daily life. So I am a positive thinker, so I'm not negating that. But that said, I also believe that optimism, without the benefit of realism, is delusional. Optimism, without the benefit of realism, is delusional. Unrealistic um, optim optimism or fantasy can cause small problems to turn into bigger ones. It can leave us defenseless when we are in harm's way. It can cause us to overlook issues that should be addressed. Narcissistic victims, because they lack healthy coping skills, typically resort to some method of denial or delusional thinking as a way to escape their realities. Um, and this is one method that is used to do that. Magical thinking is a childlike state of mind. It's a naive state of mind that tells the abused person that wishing will make it so, that everything in life has a happy ending. Um, and beyond all rationale or evidence to the contrary, the victim refuses to believe that his or her abuser is all bad. The person remains convinced that he or she will magically transform, that their abuser will magically transform into whomever he or she wants them to be. And then when the abuser does, all problems will be solved. Um, we can only hope that because by hoping that, it makes our life so much easier. It just makes everything go away. And so we want to believe that. Some of the typical rationales of narcissistically abused people um, who are magical thinkers are, there must be some good in him. No one is all bad. Have you said that to yourself? I'm sure you have. He cannot possibly be that manipulative or smart enough to mastermind the things he does. Well, he can. Um, he doesn't mean what he says. The narcissist means everything he says. And it's very calculated and cunning and made to create some sort of reaction in you. Um, he's just a product of his upbringing. He can't help it. Things will be better next time. He can change. If I'm perfect or love him enough, he'll change. I can make him see how much he hurts me. He will stop doing it. I know he loves me. He just doesn't know how to show it. If I pray about this, things will change. He doesn't really want to hurt me. He just needs help. Now, these are rationales that there are no track records or evidence to back up. So this is magical thinking. Because thinking this way is based on fantasy. There is no evidence or rationale to back it up. They are all unfounded hopes and possibilities. If the narcissist wanted to change, he certainly has been given ample opportunity to do so. So if you look back, hindsight is going to show you that he is neither willing nor committed to be any different or that he cares to examine his behavior. 
evidence is going to show you that he does not care and he is not willing to examine his behavior. Um, you know, I don't mean to say that we shouldn't have faith, hope, and optimistic um, a faith, faith, hope, or an optimistic outlook on our lives because we should. We should have all three. We should have faith. We should have hope, and we should have an optimistic outlook. Um, and abuse victims should never believe, stop believing that you can have a better future because I'm telling you, you absolutely can. I see it every single day in the people that I work with. But nothing is going to change until you are willing to acknowledge and accept the reality of your situation and then do the work required to overcome it. Um, and it's not necessarily an easy thing to overcome, but with the right counselor and the right tools, it, is, it makes it so much easier. If you try to do this yourself, it's, you're just going to go in circles in your brain. You won't be able to get out of that loop of thinking. So now let's talk about um, PTSD and complex PTSD. Those who have suffered narcissistic abuse feel controlled by their abusers, whether they are still in relationships with them or are not, are long removed from them. And the associated feelings of this physical and mental bondage can be the same as can the feelings of anger, depression, confusion, and hopelessness. They can be the same as if you were still in this relationship. Um, and, you know, I tell people you can go to the other side of the world, but you will still be attached to your abuser. This is not going to change, and you're going to repeat your patterns because many narcissistic survivors who have left these type of relationships continue to suffer debilitating repercussions of the psychological trauma. This is a serious problem that makes daily, daily living a struggle for them. So it's not uncommon for narcissistic abuse survivors to suffer from PTSD or more likely complex PTSD. And I'll tell you what the difference is. Post-traumatic stress disorder um, this is something that used to be referred to by war veterans as battle fatigue or shell shock. This occurs after a, a single traumatic event. And these symptoms usually emerge within three months of the trauma, but they can sometimes emerge years later. So there's no way of telling. Um, this is a psychiatric disorder that can manifest in anyone at any age. It develops after a person experiences either traumatic physical harm, um, a terrifying threat to their survival, or after witnessing the horrifying physical harm or treatment of someone else. Symptoms can range in severity. For someone to be diagnosed with PTSD, their symptoms must be present for more than one month. Um, the three categories of symptoms that are present in those with PTSD are reliving, avoidance, and hyperarousal. Reliving is re-experiencing the painful event as if it's curr currently happening. So um, you may reli relive your experiences through triggers, which are sights, sounds, smells, anything that, anything that brings this painful memory to the surface. Uh, nightmares, uh, you can have terrifying dreams about these painful memories. Flashbacks, realistic mental snapshots, uh, snapshots of painful past events. Compulsive thinking, repeatedly going over an experience in your mind. The other second one is avoidance. Avoidance is the evasion of something that reminds you of these painful memories, such as places, odors, sounds, tastes, songs, or activities. Um, and you may react by feeling anxious at the thought of having to re-experience an event. Um, you may react by staying busy to keep from thinking or talking about the event. You may suffer memory loss about the painful event. You may isolate or require a significant time alone um, as a reaction to the PTSD or the traumatic abuse. Uh, some feel disconnect, disconnected to others. It's very typical to avoid seeking help. 
Um, another thing is emotional numbing. And the last thing is loss of interest in prior activities. Um, now, hyperarousal is a state of being on high alert and agitated. And if you're experiencing hyperarousal, uh, this is a type of emotional hypersensitivity that causes you to always look out for danger, um, be easily startled or frightened, have difficulty concentrating, feel irritable and angry, um, and it could cause you to suffer insomnia or non-restorative sleep. This is a really serious problem. Um, people don't realize how serious it is. Many PTSD sufferers have to live on disability in, in, you know, or social services, because, and some even end up hopeless because they can't be, move past their past trauma. And they are paralyzed when they are out among people. Um, they're prone to self-medicating through drugs and alcohol addictions or calming the anxiety through smoking or obsessive compulsive disorders or eating disorders. Now, this is treatable through a combination of psychotherapy and medication. So if you believe you're suffering from PTSD, please seek out a specialist um, in PTSD um, someone who specializes in treating it and help and help can help you manage your symptoms. So complex PTSD is complex post traumatic stress disorder it is a response to the chronic stress of social or interpersonal prolonged trauma. See PTSD is different from PTSD because it is formed by the length of exposure, the inability to ex escape the trauma, personal violation and exploitation, and the fear of re-victimization. Um, for almost 25 years, there's been a debate among professionals as to whether or not complex PTSD is a separate and distinct disorder and that's not surprising because over 35 years ago when PTSD was first classified as a diagnosable condition by the American Psychiatric Association, it was also a, a controversial diagnosis. Um, and now, according to a, a report by the National Center for PTSD, approximately 8 million adults are recognized each year as having it. Um, but the American Psychiatric Association publishes the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the Bible of all um, mental health professionals, uh, which they use to diagnose their patients. Um, and two, um, two updates have been made on the Diagnostic, diagnostic and Statistic Manuals since 1980, yet they have not recognized complex, PT, P, complex PTSD as a distinct diagnosis. Um, they, it's kind of a subcategory of PTSD, which um, they've finally acknowledged in the most recently published manual. So, but many mental health professionals disagree. Um, they believe that CPSD is a standalone diagnosis and have established therapeutic models for treating patients who they believe have it. So CPTSD in particular results from captive type situations where victims experience fear, torture, and ultimately lose their sense of self. It is seen in victims of narcissistic abuse and other forms of childhood and domestic abuse. It's seen in death camp survivors, hostage survivors, and cult survivors. Um, there is a cluster of seven behavioral adaptations that is currently used to identify CPTSD as a subcategory of PTSD. One is changes in emotional regulation, um, problems modulating anger, um, alternating between eruptive and inhibited anger. The second, um, another change in emotional regulation would be preoccupation with suicidal thoughts. 
Another would be self-destructive behavior, such as self-injury, excessive risk-taking, addictions. Um, another one is dysphoria, which is depression and anxiety. Uh, another one is problems modulating your sexual urges. Person, uh, person may alternate between compulsive and inhibited sexual urges. Um, the second um, adaptation is changes in attention and consciousness. Um, I'm going to kind of speed this up because we're running out of time. Um, the third is changes in relationships. The fourth is changes in systems of meanings, which means loss of hope and despair, loss of faith or prior beliefs, uh, somatic and medical conditions. So these are pain syndromes, uh, sexual problems, digestive problems, whether they're really related to, to anything real or not. Um, changes in self-perception and self-worth. Well, I'm sure you all know what that is. And changes in the perception of your perpetrator. So you may have preoccupation with the relationship. Um, you may have adopted their belief system. You have an irras irrational attachment. Um, you've given up your control and power to your abuser. Um, you accept your perpetrator's rationalizations. You're preoccupied with revenge, and you may have gratitude toward this person. So if based on the symptoms that I mentioned, you believe you are suffering, suffering from PTSD, I mean CPSD, please seek professional help with someone who has experienced treating this disorder, somebody who can offer you skilled guidance and support um, and help you reprogram and learn how to self-regulate your responses. Um, so that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about. But, you know, I thought that was really important to share with you today because I think you will find that many of the symptoms you're experiencing were explained in this whole um, cluster of uh, narcissistic victim abuse syndrome um, symptoms. Um, just a reminder to go to Facebook, Narcissistic Abuse Survivors United, and become one of our likers um, and start commenting and liking things and making friends. Um, if you'd like to see me for counseling, you can go to my website, randygfine.com, and go to the tab that says Fine Life Issues Counseling. And there you will be able to make an appointment with me by Skype or over the telephone. And you can do this from anywhere in the world. I have people call me from all over the world. Um, with the same, same problems. We have just hundreds of thousands of, of people, if not millions, that are suffering from this kind of abuse. So um, I'm out there. I can help you. And um, that's pretty much it. That's what I wanted to share with you today. So I hope you have a wonderful day. And may joy and serenity always be yours. Goodbye. We hope you enjoyed today's programming. To learn more about Randy Fine, read her articles, or to make a counseling appointment with her, please visit randygfine.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-G-F-I-N-E dot com. Or visit her on Facebook at Randy G. Fine.
Are you ready to lose those love handles? Do you work hard to stay in shape and eat healthy, yet you can't get rid of stubborn fat? Now there's a clinically proven way to help you look slimmer without surgery or downtime. It's called Sculpture. Sculpture's innovative procedure destroys fat in just 25 minutes with visible results as quickly as six weeks. Sculpture sounds amazing, right? Check it out for yourself by clicking on the banner or go to goodbyefat.com. 